Welcome to this Ophir Photonics webinar. My name is Mark Slutsky, Product Manager for Power and Energy Measurement Solutions here at Ophir Photonics. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Um, as there's always a risk when, you know, in any profession or any area of knowledge where those who are involved in that profession don't always remember that not everyone else, <coughs> excuse me, is involved in that profession. And sometimes we tend to, you know, use, um, you know, uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Jargon and assume that the person we're talking to knows exactly what we're saying. And that isn't always the case. And, you know, Ophir Photonics is uh, a manufacturer and supplier of laser measurement instruments and our customers and potential customers, all of you are experts in whatever field you're working in, in lasers and various uh, specific laser applications, but not everyone who's an, even a seasoned professional uh, in the laser industry or some laser application, not everyone is necessarily an expert in photonic measurement instruments. So for that reason, we decided to host a webinar where we explain really just the basics. Our goal here is not to turn anyone into a laser power meter design engineer, even though it's an interesting thing to do. But uh, to give you a, you know, bring you to a certain comfort level with the concepts involved, even if only so that you'll know what questions to ask and you'll have a better grasp of the thought process um, of choosing the appropriate instrument and making sense of the readings that you're getting or knowing when something doesn't make sense and there's a problem somewhere. So with that in mind, let's begin just on a more logistical note. First, <clears throat> the total time of our discussion today should be approximately 55 zero minutes, something like that. I actually didn't get a chance to properly or didn't make <laughs> the chance to properly time myself, but it should be something around there. Questions, comments are welcome. If you have any questions or comments, please use the text chat box on the right side of your screen and I'll do my best to respond either in real time or at a suitable point in the flow of the information, depending on the nature and the timing of your questions and comments. And if I'm already saying that, I'll also add that I will leave my contact information up on the final slide for a few minutes after we conclude in case you wanna contact me offline. And if I'm already mentioning all of that, let me just add that <clears throat> we do want to make it as easy as possible for you to get a hold of us if there's any way in which we can serve you. Uh, so on every page of our website at the bottom, there's a contact us form. Um, remember, we call it contact us or request support, whatever it is that we call it, but you'll recognize it. Um, and you can contact us also through uh, our website, through our either Ophir offices or our partners in your various countries. Uh, if you don't know who those are, then on the top of the main Ophir Photonics webpage, I believe it's the right hand most item on the main menu at the top, there's a contact us page. And there per country, you can see uh, who to contact. Um, I assume you're at least to some degree familiar with Ophir. Some years back, we were acquired by Newport and some years after that, Newport along with Ophir became part of MKS Instruments. Basically what it said on that slide is that uh, we like to do the hard stuff that you would be very happy to get off your head so that you can concentrate on your work and not have to lose any sleep over the tools that you need in order to get your work done as well as possible. I think that's a fair summary. Okay, so here's what we're gonna talk about today. First, just to sort of make sure we're all speaking the same language, a brief review of what lasers do and what they're used for. Um, and as I said, really just very general and just the basics. Uh, <clears throat> on our website, we have videos and articles, including recorded on-demand webinars, which will later include this one as well, uh, about how to choose a sensor, how to choose a meter, basic technical principles of how these things work and so on and so on. And uh, you're warmly encouraged and welcome to make use of those. Um, so we'll talk about now what, our la what lasers do, which laser parameters make the various processes happen in general terms, um, and when, why, and how 
we need to monitor those parameters. Sometimes truth be told, sometimes maybe we don't. Uh, chances are that doesn't apply to anyone who's participating in a conversation of, of the sort that we're having now. Okay, so let's begin with the beginning. What lasers do, what, you know, what makes them unique and useful? Uh, so if you think of a classical light source like a light bulb, those are found less and less in the world nowadays, but it can be other light sources as well. Think of a crowd of people and each person in that crowd is going in a different direction at a different speed. Each one is occupied by something else and some of them are looking in their cell phones and therefore bumping into others and so on and so on. Um, compare that to a what we call a modern light source where every single person is moving in the same direction at the same speed, marching in unison. All the photons of light that are emitted by a laser, in theory at least, have the same wavelength. They're all in phase with each other, um, or the beam is, as we say, coherent. In theory, they're all moving in the same direction. That's not always strictly the case, but in general terms, what this all means, bottom line, and skipping over a whole lot of physics, is that we can bring a whole lot of power to a very small spot um, over long distances. Uh, now, very small spot, true. Um, even a regular light source, the beam coming out of it can be focused down to a small spot, as any kid who ever played with a magnifying glass in sunlight knows. Uh, but when all the photons are in phase, the beam is coherent, uh, it can be focused down much, much more. Um, as opposed to the magnifying glass in sunlight, uh, think of more modern examples. Uh, material processing, medical, telecom, various research applications. Um, in other words, we can use the laser in ways that we can't use regular light sources to change matter as we, you know, in very specific and very tightly controlled, precise ways, or just send the light for various purposes. So changing matter, <clears throat> for example, you know, burning it selectively to cut or drill, or melting it selectively for additive manufacturing, or uh, selectively exposing photoresist to create patterns on a silicon wafer, sending light, um, for example, communicating by sending light signals over, excuse me, over a fiber uh, to a receiver far away, or sending light signals to the moon or to a military target and measuring the time of flight, meaning the time it takes for the signal to return, all in order to measure precisely the distance, or sending 30,000 such light signals to a whole bunch of spots on a human face and measuring the time it takes for each of those to return and thereby creating a 3D map of that person's face for facial recognition purposes. Which laser parameters make the various processes happen? Because those are probably going to be the parameters that we're going to want to keep in control of if we want to keep our process stable, predictable, controlled. So let's just first consider the basic parameters and what they mean. You'd be surprised at how often just this step can avoid a lot of problems. Uh, so we're going to explain each of these in turn. Energy, power, energy density, power density. There are a few others. Uh, there's beam profile, the power, the spatial distribution map of the beam's cross-section. We'll touch on that very briefly soon. Also, sometimes we're interested in the temporal profile, uh, the shape of a laser pulse in the time domain. That can be important in some applications, such as uh, LIDAR-based distance measurement, since with LIDAR, we're basically measuring the time of flight of a pulse in order to determine the distance. So the time shape of the pulse is gonna obviously affect the distance resolution that can be achieved. So let's just explain briefly, uh, not terribly rigorously, but briefly what each of those parameters are. So pulse energy, typical unit in SI system at least is the joule. Uh, I like to use images. I, you know, as I often say, I think this is pretty typical of uh, physicists and engineers that we like visual explanations. 
Um, so think of a container that has a specific amount of fluid in it. So just to give an idea, one joule is the energy needed to raise the temperature of about a quarter of a gram of water by one degree Celsius. It's a fixed quantity of capacity to get work done, work in the physics sense, not in the colloquial sense. Um, I might have an application in which I'm using a repetitively pulsed beam. I may be interested in knowing the energy in each one of those pulses individually, and each pulse might have a different energy than each other pulse. And think of a sequence of containers of fluid where each container might have a different quantity of fluid in it. By the way, you'll notice that um, I insist, it gives me a feeling of power over Microsoft that I use the Canadian, I'm originally Canadian, I insist on using the Canadian spelling of leader instead of the American, you know, the things that make a person feel powerful, pretty pathetic, <laughs> but okay. Um, on the other hand, I may have a different application in which I again have a repetitively pulsed beam, but in this application, I might not really care about the the individual energy in each one of those pulses, I might in this application only really be interested in the overall rate of flow of energy, the number of joules per second that are coming through. That's what we call power. Um, so schematically, you can think of it this way. Uh, I couldn't find the appropriate clip art, so I kind of had to make my own. Um, we also might have a CW beam, which is not pulsed. There, of course, we can only talk about power because we don't have any fixed quantity. We have only a rate of flow. One watt is one joule per second. By the way, it's important to differentiate between two different kinds, I guess, of power. One is the number of joules per second, the overall rate of flow of energy. Um, we like to refer to that as average power. And that's in order to differentiate it from peak power or instantaneous power, which is the power during the pulse. So let's say if we have a bunch of pulses, each of which has one joule of energy in it, and those pulses are coming in at one hertz, one pulse per second. So the average power in my beam is one joule per second or one watt. But let's say if we zoom in to each one of those pulses, and that pulse is one microsecond long. So during that microsecond, my instantaneous power is one joule, not per second, it's one joule coming in over the course of a microsecond or one joule per microsecond. So that is actually uh, one megawatt. So my average power is one watt, but my peak power or instantaneous power during the course of each pulse is a megawatt. So there's a big difference. In our, in, at Ophir, we, in our technical data sheets, we only refer to average power. We have other ways of dealing with peak power when it becomes necessary, basically when it comes to damage threshold, which we'll discuss in about two or three minutes. Um, but it's just important to differentiate between the two. By the way, one thing I forgot to mention in the introduction is that um, I tried to design this presentation to keep the information as generic as possible so that it'll be as helpful as possible to as many of you as possible. Uh, it's not meant to be a, you know, an advertisement for Ophir solutions specifically. Nevertheless, having said that, when I will be bringing in examples of actual instruments, you'll appreciate that I'll be using Ophir instruments as examples because, of course, those are the only ones that I'm actually um, able to talk about. Uh, okay, so let's just get all this straight again. As I said, you'd be surprised at how often just probably just this slide can prevent a lot of confusion and problems, even among seasoned laser professionals. So again, energy per pulse is in joules. Average power, joules per second or watts um, over the course of the beam. To, as opposed to peak power or instantaneous power, which is also measured in watts, but that's during the course of one pulse. As I said, in our data sheets, we don't normally refer to that, but it's important just to be aware. Uh, energy density is the energy incident per unit area on a surface. The surface might be your workpiece. The surface might be the sensor that's measuring the beam. Either way, the energy density is measured typically in joules per square centimeter. And similarly, power density is measured in watts per square centimeter. 
power density or energy density might be the parameter of interest <clears throat> in applications involving wide or diverging beams such as those generated by LEDs used for UV curing of adhesives or dental materials or pigments. Uh, the power density incident on the surface, on the material, uh, also known as irradiance, or the cumulative energy density deposited over some time window might be the parameter that makes the process happen, that cures the adhesive, let's say. So those would be the parameters that you're going to want to keep track of so that you can remain in control of. Um, what parameter makes the work happen? So obviously, that depends on the application. Let's just have a look at a few specific and pretty typical um, laser application examples. Um, cutting, drilling, basically, we're taking a beam and focusing it down to a spot within which the power density is going to be high enough to burn, melt, vaporize, zap the material. Um, not to forget, though, that there are other issues here that will affect how well the process works. For example, the beam shape, the beam profile is going to affect the focusability, if I can coin such a word, and also the shape of the final spot inside of which the work happens, which is going to make the difference between a good cut and a bad cut, a good weld and a bad weld. Uh, when it comes to welding, it's, uh, we usually work in pulsed mode, so it's more likely the energy density is going to be the critical parameter there. Uh, military applications where we're using the laser beam to shoot down a target, usually we're not going to be focusing the beam down because the target is at a pretty you know, large distance away from us. Um, so usually it's really going to be the total power emitted by the laser that's going to make the difference, that's going to make the process happen, although power density obviously will have an effect. That physically, what's going to burn the hole through the incoming missile that we want to shoot down is going to be the power density on the appropriate spot on the missile, but uh, generally speaking, it's going to be as parallel a beam as we can manage that's going to be doing the work, beam size, beam shape. Uh, the power density needed for a given target type will depend on the material, the shape, and the orientation uh, of the surface, and so on. Also, with a target that's moving fast, there's a whole lot of other issues. It'll be more difficult to keep the beam on the same spot for long enough. For a target that's far away, um, uh, it'll be difficult to create a spot that's small enough because the atmosphere is going to be causing the beam to spread. There's a lot of research going on. This is a very, very challenging uh, application. I couldn't resist putting in you know, another application from a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. If any of you know what on earth I'm talking about, I can tell you more or less how old you are and you've already figured out more or less how old I am. Um, there's a lot of research being done using ultra short pulses where a pulse might have only say a few hundred millijoules of energy, but is only a few picoseconds long. <clears throat> so the instantaneous power, the peak power can be huge and can zap the material through non-thermal mechanisms, ablation, all sorts of different mechanisms. <clears throat> uh, really cool application I read about not long ago um, where um, just such a pulse, you know, maybe 100 millijoules or something like that, but a few picoseconds long, um, move, um, you know, is fired through the air, and the air through which the pulse moves gets ionized because of the extremely intense electromagnetic field because of the extremely high instantaneous power. And an electrical current is sent along that ionized and therefore electrically conductive air channel to zap the target as it uses the target as its path to ground, let's say a ground vehicle or something like that. Very, very cool stuff. Okay, when, why, and how? we need to monitor those parameters. Here's a typical generic materials processing application. Okay, we have a laser beam. It's, it, it's passed through some kind of focusing optics and it's brought down to a focus. If nothing gets in the way, it'll continue past focus and so on. Um, within this space, the power density is high enough to do the work that we wanted to do, to melt, vaporize the material that we're working on. 
So this is the space within which the power density is high enough to do the work. And theoretically, we're going to put our target material right there at the focal point. Um, you know, what happens, though, if something changes in the laser? Let's say aging of some electrical components in the, in the you know, power circuitry, the current drive circuit. Uh, or in the delivery optics, an optical component moves out of alignment or process debris settles on the focusing lens and the beam coming out is being slightly scattered because of that. Um, the space inside of which the power density is high enough to do the work may shift and we may suddenly find ourselves with the target surface outside the space within which the power density is high enough to make the work happen or happen correctly. And the resulting part could be different than what the process is designed to produce. A patient in a medical application might have just been harmed. Um, or increased scrap rate might have just pushed a production line from profit to loss. So we want to keep track of the parameter that's making the work happen so that we can detect anything moving out of the tolerance range that's relevant to our application. We want to keep track of the relevant parameter. We want to know what its allowed limits are. We don't want the, let's say, power or power density or energy or whatever it may be to go above or below some range that's defined by the designers of the process. Um, and if we do detect the beginnings of such an unwanted drift, we want to know about it so that we can then trigger some kind of preventive maintenance. Prevention is always better than repair. Uh, here are some examples, an industrial uh, laser-based system, uh, cutting, drilling. This is uh, from a dental laser uh, system. Uh, here you can see some via holes in silicon wafers. It's not hard to appreciate how being somewhat out of tolerance could mess up everything we're trying to do and what parameter moving out of tolerance and what the tolerance is, that obviously will depend on the specific application. Sometimes it's obvious and sometimes it may take some thought, by the way. Um, Here's an interesting one. This is from a customer that I visited uh, quite some years back. This customer manufactures jet engine blades, and they were given a requirement by their market to use laser marking to mark a serial number on every single blade for the purpose of, God forbid, accident investigation. And God forbid, there's some accident and it's found that the accident was caused by failure related to the engine blades, the turbine blades. They want to be able to basically identify any engine in, on any aircraft out there in the world somewhere that is using blades that were made by the same machine during the same shift by the same operator so that we can perform preventive maintenance, have a look, see if those blades also have a problem and whatever. Um, and their customers didn't want them, the supplier of the blades, to suddenly have a bad delay in delivery because at the last minute a problem was found. Um, so they asked us to help them institute a procedure for regularly, whatever regularly means, checking the quality of the laser marking system so that if there is a problem, they'll know about it before it delays shipment of blades rather than after. Laser fusion, I just put that in because it's cool, not because there's anything specific that we've come across. Um, okay, so we've established the need for accurate measurement of the appropriate parameters of the laser in order to keep my process on target. Um, and I want to measure that parameter within a given accuracy. I want to just say a few words about what that means because it's not just a word. Accuracy means how close is the reading by this instrument to the quote unquote absolute truth, by which we mean the value that would be measured by some agreed upon reference. Unfortunately, most of us don't have easy access to the absolute truth. Um, so we have to agree on what we mean by the absolute truth. And we generally agree, and this is understood by the whole, by any industry, 
uh, as referring to some agreed upon reference. It might be NIST, it might be the German PTB, uh, and so on and so on. As long as we all agree on what we mean, then we're good. Um, so if a laser power meter data sheet says it measures with an accuracy of, let's say, plus minus 3%, that means that the calibration, we'll explain that word in the next bullet, uh, of this instrument is traceable to, say, NIST, and any reading it gives is guaranteed to be within plus or minus 3% of what NIST would say the power is in this case. Um, this is a huge oversimplification, but you get the general idea. What's calibration? Calibration is the process of comparing an instrument to a, let's say, NIST traceable reference to know exactly how accurate the instrument is. So at Ophir, when we finish production of a laser power sensor, we take a measurement using it of a stable laser, and we compare that to a measurement that we take with a similar sensor that was calibrated by NIST and returned to us, and we spent the bomb of money and it took a very, very long time. Um, but then we take that comparison, and now we know just how close or not close this sensor reads to what NIST would say it should read. Um, often, maybe even usually, uh, there's then a step of adjusting that sensor so that it reads the same, as close to the same as we can manage, as the NIST reference does, although not critically so, because even if I don't adjust it, and it continues to read 3.2% below the NIST reference, but if I then give you that sensor, and I tell you this sensor reads 3.2% below the NIST reference, that's fine, because then you know exactly how to get an accurate measurement. In most cases, it does include the comparison step, and again, this is a drastic oversimplification. Um, many users often refer to calibration of their laser-based systems. So here you're looking at a side panel of a medical, a surgical laser system, and it has a, an opening here which the users refer to as a calibration port or a cal port. Inside that hole is a laser power sensor, a laser power meter, that's been calibrated, and before any surgery or once a day or once a week or once every whatever it is, the user, in this case the surgeon, takes the handpiece that he or she are going to use to do the surgery, sticks that into the hole and fires the laser. The system knows how much drive current it sent into the laser. It knows based on the buttons that the surgeon pressed to do this test. It knows what power it's expecting to, to get. And then it compares that to what it actually measures when the surgeon fires the laser. And if necessary, it'll make some internal adjustments so that the laser really is producing what the system expects it to be producing so that we can now go and perform a surgical procedure on a, on a human patient uh, and not cause any harm. So that's just a good example. A typical measurement instrument will consist of a sensor, and a meter. The meter might not be a meter, it might be a PC interface. The sensor is the laser facing end, the input end, the transducer that receives the laser beam to be measured and produces some sort of signal that represents the parameter of interest, such as the power, uh, if it's a power sensor. Um, in Ophir sensors, for example, the raw output signal happens to be an analog current. That's just how our systems work. The calibration data, which will tell the rest of the measurement instrument how to interpret that current, knowing that the current is proportional to the power isn't enough. I need to know the constant of proportion so that I can turn that ultimately into a readout that a person can make sense out of. Um, so the calibration data um, is stored in an EEPROM, in a memory circuit, inside that connector at the end of the cable coming out of the sensor. Um, the meter, some manufacturers call it a display or a console or a controller, every manufacturer uses their own terminology, is the user-facing end, which measures the analog signal coming from the sensor. Uh, so it too is a precision measurement instrument uh, that needs periodic recalibration. Okay. Um, it measures that signal. Uh, it reads the data stored in that memory circuit so that it knows how to 
convert that signal into a reading, plus any other things it needs to know about the identity of that sensor, such as what uh, it needs to prompt the user to select, what, you know, all, all the different things it needs to know. Measures a signal, processes it, which may include reading the data stored in the EEPROM, and then ultimately outputs the measured reading, such as via a numeric display to a human user, or maybe a digital interface to a PC with software running, you know, as the, as the case may be. The software might be from the instrument manufacturer or the user's own software, or if it's an OEM instrument integrated inside a user's system, such as that medical instrument we saw on the previous slide, then some host system controller. We'll look at mainly the sensors in our conversation now, since the differences among those are physical, technical. The wrong choice of sensor could mean incorrect measurement or no measurement or a, a damaged sensor. Um, the choice of meter, on the other hand, is functional. It's all about how you want the measurement results to be shown to you and what maybe mathematical operations you might want to be able to perform on those, uh, on those readings. So we'll look at the various types of sensors. We will come back to the meters, don't worry. Uh, note, by the way, that the meter and sensor might be combined in a single device sometimes. That has advantages and disadvantages, like most things in life. Uh, we'll look at some of those shortly, and we'll say a few words about when that might be the preferred approach. So for measuring low power, like from nanowatts, picowatts, maybe up to typically a couple hundred milliwatts, we usually use a photodiode-based sensor. Um, various types for different spectral regions, silicon, in-gas, germanium, and so on. Um, for powers usually moderate and upwards, uh, usually from a few milliwatts uh, all, uh, and upwards, usually one will use a thermal type sensor. It's a, basically there's a metal disc with an absorber on it. And on the back side of the disc, inside the body of the sensor, there's a thermal pile, a ring configured usually uh, sensor that measures heat flow, which is going to be proportional to the power of the beam that was that's getting absorbed. And then it'll output that analog signal and so on and so on. Uh, from milliwatts, typically uh, at Ophir, we actually have one that measures as low as a few microwatts, which is very sensitive for this kind of sensor. And these are used for powers up to, you know, at Ophir, we actually have a thermal sensor that measures up to 120 kilowatts. A uh, small desktop type of sensor. Where's my forward button here? Um, for extremely low powers, we often will use what you see here. It's often referred to as a radiometer, although that's a word that kind of is used in many different ways in many different situations. Basically, either for very, very low powers or even for sort of low powers, but in spectral regions for which we don't have, you know, uh, regular photodiodes, let's say to measure 100 nanowatts in the visible the, or the near IR, we'll use a silicon photodiode. But if you want to measure 100 nanowatts in the mid IR, there are exotic semiconductor photodiodes, but those aren't always a good choice. They might be expensive or whatever. So often we'll use what you see here, a uh, radiometer, which uses a, in most cases, it's a pyroelectric type sensor, which we usually would use for measuring pulse energy. We'll look at that in a second, although I don't want to get too caught up in the details. And it has a digitally synthesized lock-in amplifier in, in the electronics box. And the beam to be measured is passed through a chopper. And the chopper chops or modulates the beam at a very specific frequency. And the lock-in amplifier circuit ignores any signal that's not riding on exactly that frequency. And by doing that, we can eliminate background noise um, to several orders of magnitude. And so we can measure powers down to very low, you know, even as low as femtowatts, even in regions, spectral regions for which our detector is not terribly sensitive. So in theory, we're actually able to measure signals below what is normally the noise floor. Um, we have a lot of applications involving diverging beams that has a bunch of challenges capturing the entire beam. Usually we'll use an integrating sphere. It's a hollow ball, the inside of which uh, has a white diffuse, highly reflective coating. 
and one or several ports, and I won't go into the details of how it works, it's actually a very cool device, um, with or without a built-in calibrated sensor. So we'll use those for measuring laser diodes like Vixels, LEDs in, in many applications. Um, in some applications, like the one we mentioned earlier of UV curing of adhesives or dental materials or something, we might not really be interested in capturing the entire beam to measure the total power in it, but we might be interested only in measuring the power density, the irradiance on the surface, because that's what makes the process happen in that example of UV curing. Um, so, you know, here you see a UV lamp in a, this is, well, okay, not a very clear picture, but this is from the food industry. This is used for UV antibacterial work. It, you know, certain specific UV wavelengths, I forget which ones, uh, have antibacterial and antiviral properties. So there we don't need an integrating sphere. We just want a sensor that's going to measure the power density on a surface, the irradiance, or the total accumulated energy density over a given time frame. Um, and that's the process that makes it happen. So here you see two sensors from Ophir that are designed for that. You might notice that there's a diffuser here because the beam is not a parallel beam like that coming out of a laser, but it's widely diverging and the diffuser gets rid of angle effects that would affect the accuracy of the measurement. This particular model is meant for UV applications. So you can see that it's the material is a little bit different. It's clear anodized. It's designed to be able to survive the experience of being placed for a long time in a UV beam and taking measurements. Um, there are some various uh, issues that impose limits on what a given sensor can measure. The spectral range of a sensor is determined by its absorber. If it's a photodiode, then the photodiode. If it's a thermal sensor, then the absorber used will determine the spectral behavior. Some absorbers measure over a wide spectral range with a pretty flat response. Others measure over a wide range, but with a very not flat response. Others measure over a narrow range. And each one of the you know, various absorber types will have all sorts of different properties uh, that will lead us to choose it for a given application. Some have very good damage threshold. They can withstand very high power densities or very high energy densities without damage, but their spectral response is not so comfortable. There's always trade-offs, and here you just see, for example, a bunch of different spectral curves of uh, various absorbers that we use. The damage threshold, I mentioned this a moment ago, the maximum power density in the case of a power sensor that a given absorber can handle is also a function of the absorber material. One of the important um, parameters that are specified in any sensor's data sheet. The maximum number of kilowatts per square centimeter that the sensor can handle without damage. It, de it depends on the power level, among other things that's being used. The same absorber at 10 kilowatts will have a, a lower damage threshold than that same absorber if we're measuring only 10 or 50 watts or something like that. Um, and here you can just see some pretty dramatic examples of damage. Very important to remember you don't have to measure power at the focal spot. It's the same number of watts outside focus as inside focus. It's just not the same number of watts per square centimeter. So if inside focus that laser can you know, burn holes through sheet metal because that's what the system is designed to do, then inside focus, it might also burn holes through your sensor. You don't want to do that. So very often, just moving a few millimeters this way or that way so that the beam defocuses just enough so that it's outside the damage, so that you're no longer, you know, you've no longer gone beyond the damage threshold, very often, you don't need to move terribly much in order to sufficiently defocus to be able to work. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, as opposed to the maximum power density, the maximum total power that a sensor can handle depends on how well it can get rid of the heat. A laser beam is coming in, getting absorbed, being, you know, that heat is being turned into a signal. That heat has to go somewhere. So the sensor body has to be designed to get rid of the heat at least as fast as the heat's coming in. Otherwise, the sensor is going to overheat and eventually something's going to fail. Um, so the sensor body design is what really determines its maximum power capacity. 
and so you'll have fan cooled sensors you'll have sensors whose body is designed to serve as a heat sink for higher power industrial applications usually will be using water cooled sensors which water to use is a whole bunch of considerations there we have quite a few articles on our website um, regarding issues about water cooling and what types of water and different things that you need to be aware of uh, the maximum beam size obviously is going to be determined by the aperture of the sensor um, although there are some tricks there if you have a Gaussian beam um, what looks to you like the beam size might not really be the beam size there's generally quite a bit of beam beyond what your eyes can see as the outer limits of the beam so something to be aware of because you might unknowingly be cutting off some outer wings of your beam an effect called uh, oh what's it called um, vignetting the French word from window um, in some applications, we measure single shot pulse energy. A few medical applications and quite a few welding applications work this way, where you fire one pulse and then you wait and check and so on. That one pulse might have energy of many hundreds of joules or even kilojoules. So we usually will measure that using the same type of thermal sensors that we use for measuring power, but they're used in a slightly different mode. What happens is there's one pulse, the signal coming out of the detector um, shortly after the pulse arrives the signal the heat reaches that outer ring of detectors the signal the, the heat signal right now the electrical output signal begins to rise reaches a peak drops back down to zero the instrument th don't worry you don't have to calculate the integral the instrument does the area under the curve is the total energy that was inside that pulse the integral of um, power over time, basically. Um, so generally, uh, you have it waits. You have to wait a few seconds before firing another pulse while the instrument integrates and measures the pulse. Here you see what it typically looks like. Typically, the meter will signal ready when it's ready for the next pulse to be fired. Uh, for repetitively pulsed beams, you need a sensor that's physically fast enough to measure every pulse and differentiate between them. Usually we'll use pyroelectric energy sensors. Sometimes energy sensors are actually based on a semiconductor photodiode. Those are for the lowest energies where we want something that's particularly sensitive. There are the limits. Again, maximum min minimum energy are set by the specifics of the design of the sensor. Its spectral range is a function of the absorber. Maximum energy density, which is another kind of damage threshold similar to maximum power density. Also, every such sensor will have in its data sheet the maximum pulse repetition rate for which it can measure energy per pulse and the maximum pulse width. Some sensors can measure pulses that are, you know, milliseconds long, others only a few microseconds. That's uh, an important parameter to be aware of. Okay, so how do you choose a sensor? Don't panic. Okay, we have on our website, and I believe other manufacturers have something similar, a software tool that we call the sensor finder. It asks you to, for, to input the laser parameters that it needs to know, that it must know in order to choose the right sensor, and then it'll give you a list of sensors that can do the job, including under, those, under your laser conditions, how close each of those sensors would be to its damage threshold. So for example, if the first sensor on the list is at 90% of damage threshold, you don't want to choose that sensor. You want to choose one that's safely below. Usually we recommend to try and not go above 50% of the damage threshold because there are always tolerances. It can also be downloaded, by the way. We have an advanced version of it for diverging beams. We also have a meter finder, which is a little bit different. We'll look at that in a second just how to get to the sensor finder from the main page of Ophir Photonics, the main menu at the top, support, and then you'll see sensor finder. Uh, just a few words, as I said, I would say about meters before we're, we conclude. Um, one of the first questions you'll wanna ask yourself when deciding about a meter is whether you want a handheld or desktop, whatever, device with its own built-in display and so on, as you see here, or a direct to PC interface. Just remember that the display is much more than just a display. It's a measurement instrument. It does processing and so on. 
Um, and the PC interface is much more than just a PC interface. It's not just a hub. It's also a measurement device. All it's doing is that it's outsourcing the display. It's outsourcing the output to the software that's running on your PC or laptop. Um, I mentioned the meter finder. It's not a software tool like the sensor finder is because, as I said, here it's more a question of what kind of functionality do you want, not technical calculations. So this is more of a comparison table, um, you know, which measurement modes each different instrument uh, supports and which sensor families each instrument does or maybe doesn't support and so on. Uh, very important, I want to draw your attention to a short video that we have here that walks you through the thought process of selecting the best meter for your needs. And again, even if, God forbid, you're using somebody else's equipment, the thought process is the same thought process. I warmly invite you to check out that video. Uh, brilliantly worded, expertly presented. I'm joking. I'm, I'm the speaker there. So <laughs> I like to kid around about that sort of thing. I just uh, I mentioned briefly beam profiling. It's not the product line that I deal with, but I would just want to say a couple of words about it before we before we conclude. Um, I mentioned it's the spatial distribution of power within the beam's cross-section. Uh, so here's an actual case. Uh, this is actually discussed in a white paper on our website. Um, medical, medical implantable device manufacturer. Um, big company, many facilities, okay? In this particular implantable device, I have no clue what it is, um, was being produced in parallel at two different facilities of the company. And in both facilities, they had an identical setup, identical laser, identical laser equipment, the same setup, except that in one facility, the welds that were being performed by that laser welding system were fine, whereas in the other facility, the welds kept failing, luckily, at inspection. Um, the processes looked the same. The equipment was the same. They couldn't figure out the problem, so we were helping them. And when we measured the profiles and the powers, it turns out that the two processes were not exactly the same. Um, the beam profiles were different for whatever reason. I think it was something to do with the alignment of some optical component somewhere. Uh, that's already actually less critical. The point is once they found the problem, then fixing it was relatively easy. Uh, so as we mentioned earlier, beam profiling, the beam profile affects the focusability of the beam for the same focusing optics and what the focal spot will be shaped like. And in some cases, the wrong shape basically means failure of whatever it is that you're trying to produce there. Well, different types of equipment are used for measuring the beam profile. Typically, a CCD camera, various types depending on spectral region, all sorts of optical accessories to make sure that the camera isn't being zapped. Um, or a rotating slit where two counter rotating, well, two slits that are, ro or two orthogonal slits that are rotating at high speed, it builds up a profile of the beam. They're used in different situations for different purposes. Each has pluses and minuses way beyond the scope of our discussion. Now, whoever it is, you know, the manufacturer that you're in discussion with, you know, will together with you figure out which one makes, you know, is more appropriate for your particular application needs. Uh, various special items measuring the 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 shape of the and location of the focal spot, um, the m squared, which is a measure of how close your beam is to a perfect Gaussian. All sorts of different specialty tools that different application you know that address needs of various applications. Just I have to point this out because it's cool, very cool solution that was introduced a couple years ago by Ophir Spiracon. The concept is based on a physical property of light known as Rayleigh scattering, where the highly concentrated light around the laser's beam waist, the focal spot, but it's not really a spot, is scattered off air molecules in its vicinity. And that scattered light is captured by a camera. This allows for a non-contact, um, it's not exactly a beam profiler, but it's a focal spot analyzer. Uh, it's a, an analysis of the laser's waste without coming into contact with the beam. So there's no water cooling required. There's no upper limit on the power of the beam that it can work with, um, and so on and so on. And because it's a camera-based analyzer, it's operating at video rates, which means you're able to monitor dynamic performance, time-dependent uh, 
performance of you know of the beam various uh, various parameters. Uh, all right, and just a few words. I had mentioned combination instruments, where multi where the sensor and the meter might in some cases be combined into one device. Here you see three such devices. The fourth one is a multifunction instrument, but it's not standalone. Uh, these two are specially designed for additive manufacturing and similar process chambers where the device goes inside the chamber and no human hand is able to reach in and start pressing buttons. Uh, this is a combination of a beam profiler and a power meter in one device. Uh, this is meant for integration in factory floors uh, with multiple, let's say, welding or, or drilling stations. Uh, it's all where the whole factory floor is controlled by a central server. And before each workpiece is processed, the server will move the laser head over the measurement device or the other way around, open the protective cover, take a measurement, make sure everything's okay. If not, make whatever internal adjustments it needs to the laser drive circuitry and then start working on the new workpiece. And so no human hand touches this thing. This is an industrial design body, industrial connectors. It communicates using industrial communication protocols and so on. This is a multifunction um, uh, integrating sphere-based sensor, mainly for VIXELs and similar, where it measures both the, the power, it measures the power and the temporal pulse shape. There's a BNC connector that goes out to a scope. And there's also a, uh, uh, an SMA output to sample some of the light out to another instrument, for example, a spectrometer and so on. Okay, so in summary, we've talked about the importance of measuring the appropriate performance parameter of our laser, the appropriate parameter being the one that makes our process happen. Um, we need to be able to define the accuracy to which we're taking that measurement. Uh, so we want a appropriately calibrated measurement instrument. And we looked at the different types of instruments in general that are used for measuring those various types of parameters, average power, low power, medium and high power, very low power, energy per pulse, single shot repetitively. And we briefly talked about a few different types of instruments that are used for measuring beam profile and related parameters like the um, beam waste, the focus, focus, focal spot shape and location. We talked about some applications where we want to measure the temporal pulse shape of of, of the pulse. Uh, for example, in LIDAR-based systems where the temporal shape of the pulse will set limits on the resolution to which we can measure the distance. And we just, in less than one sentence, said a few words about additional parameters like measuring M squared or measuring uh, you know, all sorts of other things. Okay, that's what I wanted to cover. Um, I realized that I talked fast. Oh, some sorry, I'm only now, not good. I'm only now looking at Questions. I see that there was a question. I don't know how long. Oh, okay. Looks like it came in only recently. Uh, what is beam track? Okay. On the Ophir website, we have a family of sensors that we call beam track, um, which are basically a combination of it's, they're based on regular thermal sensors for measuring beam power. But in addition, they also have on them um, the function of measuring the beam, the, the beam location. And in some cases, the beam size. So measuring the power and size and location of the beam, it's where you don't need a full beam profile, but you do want to see if the beam is getting bigger or smaller, if it's translating left or right as you're, you know, twisting this knob or something like that. So in some, in some applications, it's really a just what the doctor ordered kind of solution. I didn't mention it because of it, but I'm glad that somebody did. Um, so in some applications, it's, it's a very neat solution that combines a few different parameters into one sensor. Um, is that the only question? That's the only question. Okay, I realized that this was kind of very, very fast. As I said, I didn't want to go into too much detail about any one point. I hope that the balance I found between breadth and depth was as appropriate as possible for as many of you as possible. Um, if you have any questions you want to ask online, you still have a few more seconds. Uh, but if not, you're more than welcome to contact me or us offline. My name again is Mark Slatsky, Product Manager for Power and Energy Measurement Solutions here at Ophir Photonics. This is my email address, mark.slatsky at mksinst.com. Also, as I said, you can contact us through our website, through our 
either Ophir offices or our partners in your various countries, depending on where you are and so on. I hope this was helpful. Dare I say, maybe even interesting. Um, thank you very much for being with us. Stay healthy and have a really nice rest of the day. Thank you.